Christian Horner, the helmet camera wearer in that race, has no doubt where his ambitions lie in motorsport. Do you fancy a crack at uh, the real top level eventually? Yes, yeah, that's my ultimate ambition. That's what I'd like to do. Red Bull Racing has won 11 championships in 17 years during their time as a manufacturer in F1. And there's only been one constant through all of that success, Christian Horner. He was a complete unknown when he entered the sport, but now sits amongst the great names like Chapman, Williams, Todd and Dennis. And he has an incredible story, from failing as a racing driver to forming his own team, all the way to leading Red Bull to 11 championships. So how exactly has he done this? Back when I was a bit younger, I actually even tested for Christian Horner on his way to F1. But we'll get back to that a little bit later. From a very early age, Christian Horner had a passion. He wanted to drive quickly. And this coupled with his competitive nature meant it wasn't long before he was pestering his parents for a go-kart. And at the age of 12, his mum finally gave in and found a second-hand go-kart in a local Leamington Spa newspaper where Christian grew up. He quickly went from driving it around their garden to heading to the local track at Shennington. I also did a lot of karting at Shennington, absolutely brilliant kart track. And it turned out he was quite good. He made it all the way to the World Karting Championships. And even though he might not look it, Christian is quite the athlete. He also competed tennis at Junior Wimbledon in his school years. This success in karting got the attention of the higher formula. At the time, Renault was looking to help young drivers move up the ranks and they offered Horner a scholarship to drive in the British Formula Renault Championship for Manor Motorsport in 1991. You might remember Manor from their short period in F1. Horner impressed once again, winning a round at Pembury, taking a couple of pole positions and finishing as the highest placed rookie in the championship. And the champion that year was no slouch either. He was future Formula 1 driver Pedro De La Rosa. For 1993, Horner moved up to the British Formula 3 Class B, which wasn't quite the elite competition, but still a decent level. He drove for Roly Vincini's P1 Engineering and continued his success from Formula Renault. He ended up winning six races and finishing second in the championship. And it was looking like he was one driver to watch. After completing a year in the lower Class B, Horner stepped up once again into the main British F3 class with Fortec for 1994. But this is where his success starts to run out, as does his money. He continued to race in British Formula 3 for the 1995 and 96 seasons, but his highest championship finish was a lowly 16th position. Unfortunately, money is the biggest factor for all young racers. Follow your racing dream is expensive, and Christian Horner found himself without the money to get himself into a seat for the 97 season. He had his sights set on Formula 3000, which in those days was the feeder series to F1, similar to F2 now. But what Horner decided to do next would be one of the riskiest but best decisions of his life, and one not many other people would have the bravery to do. He decided to start his own team so that he could continue his driving career. He sold everything he had, borrowed money from the bank and his dad, which got him enough to buy a chassis and lease two engines. He also persuaded his old boss, Vincini, to be his race engineer and based the team out of the shed behind his house in Norfolk. And with that, Arden International was born. He needed a trailer to move his new team around in, but luckily he found a mysterious figure in Austria that would sell one to him. Horner travelled to meet this man who incidentally was running two F3000 cars of his own with two promising drivers including a certain Juan Pablo Montoya. In a strange turn of fate, this man turned out to be Dr. Helmut Marco, head of the Red Bull Young Drivers Programme. In typical Marco style, he ran a hard bargain and made Horner pick it up at Calais a week later, even though he demanded the cash up front. And of course, there was no paperwork involved either. It was all agreed on a handshake. But Helmut Marco's handshake was reliable and the trailer duly arrived in Calais a week later. And it's these negotiation skills that will turn up later in the story. Over the next two years, Horner worked almost every job in his new team and worked out how to deal with motor racing, from driving to sorting out supplies, travel arrangements and finding sponsors. He did it all to keep his team afloat. The team didn't even have spare parts. So if he crashed, he would have to choose between mending the car and paying people's wages. And of course, this affected his driving. He admitted himself he built in a safety margin to ensure that he finished races and not add to his bills. And to be fair, this really showed in the results as he would finish 21st that year. However, 1998 would be another turning point for the Christian Horner story. Arden brought on Kurt Mullekens to drive alongside Horner and bring some much-needed cash to the team. Kurt also turned out to be very quick and he would lead the championship 
championship until a big shunt at Hockenheim finished his season. But it was at a test in Estoril when Christian was following Juan Pablo Montoya through a fast corner. Here he would see the Colombian's commitment and speed and he realised that he would never be able to match it. It was at this moment he made a decision that he would change the course of his life once again. He was going to retire from racing and focus on taking Arden International to F1. Just like the decision to form the team, without this brave realisation we may never have heard of Christian Horner. The decision to hang up his gloves coincided with the introduction of Dave Richards into this story. Dave Richards, the owner of ProDrive and later BAR Honda in F1, came to Christian wanting to become a 50-50 shareholder in Arden. ProDrive had been working in touring cars with the Russian oil company Look Oil and the boss's son Viktor Maslov wanted to get into Formula 3000. As Richards and Horner were family friends, it felt like a natural alliance. But there were no hometown discounts for Richards. Christian needed the money. During negotiations, Horner came up with a figure that he thought was well over the asking price. But to his surprise, Richards gladly accepted. So Horner took the money and the security of the ProDriver umbrella. For the 1999 season, the team ran with Mark Goosens and their benefactor Maslow. Unfortunately, the next couple of seasons didn't go to plan. So Horner bought back the 50% share from Richards and split from his Russian backing. For 2002, Arden International had a whole new lineup. Czech Thomas Enger and Swede Bjorn Verdheim. And these drivers were hired for their pace rather than their financial backing. Over the next two seasons, Horner's decision to prioritize talent really paid off. Arden would win back to back F3000 titles and each of their drivers would win the title, with Enger beating future F1 driver Sebastian Bourdais in 2002. However, it turned out that Enger had been enjoying himself a little bit too much, smoking something that he shouldn't have been. He subsequently failed a drugs test at the Hungarian event and had his points taken away for that race, and so he'd lost the title as a result. With great success on track over the previous two seasons, Horner had his sights firmly set on taking Arden to F1, but a certain Helmut Marko would intervene to change the course of Horner's life once again. Since the last time we saw him, Marco had sold his team and was now running Red Bull Junior. He was looking after Vitantonio Liuzzi, who was looking like a very promising prospect and would go on to drive for both of Red Bull's F1 teams. Funnily enough, I was a very small part of this story. I actually tested for Arden in 2004, when the Arden International team was looking for a driver. I'd been racing in single seaters for a couple of years and won a couple of championships, and did a three day test with Horner and the Arden International team in 2004 at Estoril. Anyway, similar to Horner, I couldn't find the funding to race in GP2 that year. It was about £800,000, so I went back to coaching. Anyway, back to Christian Horner's story. Horner did a deal to get Liuzzi in his Arden for the 2004 season, and once again, Marco ran a hard bargain. The deal had very little base pay, but great win bonuses. If Liuzzi didn't perform, Arden would go bust. But luckily for Horner, or a calculated risk on his part, Liuzzi absolutely stormed the championship, winning seven of the 10 rounds and finishing second twice, taking the title easily. This only confirmed to Horner that it was time for Arden to step up to F1. Before we move on, let's take a moment to appreciate the impressive rise of Arden International. Within the span of seven years, Horner had created the team from scratch in a Norfolk shed, developed it into a stable team, and then became three-time back-to-back F3000 team champions. Through Bernie Eccleson, Horner got in touch with Eddie Jordan, who was looking to sell his F1 team, but he asked for a rumoured £50 million, which was, of course, out of Horner's range. Shocked at how much money he would need, he spoke to his old friend, Helmut Mark about his options. Coincidentally, Marco knew Dietrich Matasic was looking to increase his involvement in F1 by buying a controlling stake in a team. So Marco set up a meeting in Salzburg between the three of them to discuss their respective options. Unbeknownst to Horner, this would be the first meeting of what would go on to be one of the most successful alliances in F1 history. While Horner had been eyeing up Jordan, Matasic saw more potential in buying the Jaguar team, where Red Bull had placed their driver Christian Klein. The meeting went well, but no decisions were made and the parties went their separate ways. Horner not hearing anything from the Austrians for months. Then on November 2004, Matasic announces he has just bought the Jaguar F1 team, just hours before the deadline to submit teams for the following season. Meanwhile, Horner was continuing to talk to Jordan about selling and making plans for Arden to join the next GP2 series, which was replacing F3000. He even signed Heke Kovalainen and Nicolas Lapierre to pilot the cars. Lapierre was really quick as well. That's probably why I didn't get to see. 
<laughs> These two would go on to do big things. Kovalainen would partner Lewis Hamilton and McLaren in F1 and Lapierre would become a world-class endurance driver. Horner definitely had an eye for talent. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't help my case, does it? However, Horner would never make it to GP2 with Arden. As over Christmas of 2004, Marco invited Horner to meet up with Matasic once again. But this time, they had a proposal for him. And just like that, Christian Horner became the team principal of Red Bull Racing and the youngest team boss in F1. F1 history at only 32 years old. But the work was only just beginning for Horner. He only had a couple of months before the start of the new season and a team to get to know. His first day, the 7th of January, showed the realities of his new position and the world of F1. Helmut Marko fired the previous regime in the morning. The rest of the staff were introduced to him as the new team principal and then the Red Bull contingent flew back to Austria, leaving Christian to get on with it. It was such a quick turnaround that when Horner was shown to his new office, the previous team principal's post and half drunk coffee was still there. And of course, this left Horner to think, where exactly do I start? He started by visiting all of the departments of the team to determine where the strengths and weaknesses fell. And what he discovered was pockets of real quality, but a lack of direction and confidence that a revolving door of management would do to a team. Whatever early changes he made, they must have worked as the team turned up to Australia and scored a double points finish, something Jaguar didn't achieve in all four years of their ownership. Red Bull would go on to score 34 points for their inaugural season. What was different was Red Bull's approach to racing. They injected fun back into the paddock. Formula One had become a stiff corporate world, but Matasic was eager to bring Red Bull's core values and non-conformity to shake up that world. The perfect symbol of this non-conformity was the energy station, Red Bull's motorhome. The energy station was a giant three-story motorhome and hospitality center. It took a group of 25 to construct it and 11 trucks to ferry it from race to race. Unlike the other motorhomes, it had an open door policy and would thump out loud music all weekend. It became a hub of activity and somewhere people wanted to be. Red Bull wanted to win. They were going to win their way and have lots of fun doing it. This didn't go unnoticed by the F1 paddock and one person in particular was attracted by Red Bull's unique approach to racing. Adrian Newey had been the best car designer in F1 for a decade at this point, having built his reputation in IndyCar and then at March in the 1980s, designing their most successful car. He then went on to design championship winning cars at Williams in the early 90s and at McLaren in the late 90s. It would be quite the statement if they could prize Newey away from McLaren, but the stars were aligning. By the time Red Bull entered F1, the relationship between Newey and McLaren had started to break down and Horner saw an opportunity. He used their mutual friend David Coulthard to set up a meeting and show Newey the power of Red Bull to get to know him on a personal level. This was a great strategic move by Horner by getting to know the person and showing him that Red Bull's approach was to win but have fun while doing it. He showed him everything they could offer that McLaren had neglected. Another advantage Horner had was that he just had to get the approval of one person to get an offer to Newey. Horner broached the subject of Newey joining the team with him and was caught out by just how much Adrian Newey would cost, around £10 million a year, which was quite a bit more than he had budgeted for. But he got on the phone with Matasic to see what could be done. The number was mentioned, there was a pause on the other end, and then Matasic came back on. Let's go for it. This is a unique thing about Red Bull. It's Matasic's company. It belongs to him and one other person. There was no board meeting, no shareholders approval, just a quick decision. Within a day, Horner had offered the job to Newey. He had accepted and told Ron Dennis that he was leaving McLaren to become chief technical officer at Red Bull Racing. And this set a precedent for the rest of the F1 world. If the best designer in the business saw potential in Red Bull, it must be doing something right. Red Bull became one of the most attractive teams in the whole paddock. Their rise to the top of F1 had begun. With Adrian on board, Red Bull saw a raft of incoming personnel from other F1 teams that would go on to make their championship winning team, including Jonathan Wheatley and Paul Monaghan, amongst others over the 2006 season. The seeds for future success were really sown in the early years of Horner's time at Red Bull. The 2007 season saw a switch from Ferrari to Renault engines, and Mark Webber returned to the team he left less than three years earlier. While there was progress up the grid, the first years of the Adrian Newey era didn't 
didn't produce quite the results the team were looking for, finishing 5th and 7th in the Constructors' Championship in 07 and 08. But the team had their sights firmly set on 2009, and a regulation change that had the potential to flip F1 on its head. The regulations for 2009 drastically reduced the amount of downforce the cars could produce, with no more aero appendages on the bodywork, and the return of slick tyres making it a very different formula for success. This gave the teams further down the grid an opportunity to jump ahead of their rivals, and Red Bull did just this. They narrowly missed out on both championships in 2009 due mainly to unreliability, but with Adrian Newey's revolutionary blown diffuser, the Red Bull quickly became the car to beat in this new era of F1. Red Bull would go on a run few teams have experienced in F1 history, winning all eight championships between 2010 and 2013, with Sebastian Vettel becoming one of the most decorated drivers in F1 history. This time didn't go without issue though. The pressure of fighting for F1 championships creating a divide between the drivers that boiled over publicly at times, with Turkey 2010 and Malaysia 2013 being these boiling points. Both times the team would come out in support or protection of Vettel, their homegrown talent nurtured through the Red Bull Academy, giving the team a reputation similar to Ferrari in the 2000s with Schumacher and Barrichello. While Horner and others in Red Bull's hierarchy resisted this, this, saying both drivers had an equal chance of winning, it would seem that Vettel was the team's preferred driver to win the championships. And he did. At the end of 2013, Christian Horner was included in the Queen's Christmas Honours list, receiving an OBE for his services to motorsport. But unfortunately for Horner and Red Bull, another regulation change in 2014 would put a hard stop to their championship run, and make the team once again have to fight their way to the front. The introduction of the 1.6 litre V6 turbo hybrid engines in 2014 gave their engine supplier Renault quite a few headaches, and the power unit provided was nowhere near the standard of the Mercedes, who would go on to dominate F1 for the next seven years. The next year saw a lot of personnel changes both in and out of the car. Sebastian Vettel left for Ferrari in 2015, and other key team members left for promotions at rival teams, and the team stalled as a result. A general lack of race winning pace and reliability issues meant they were unable to fight for the championship, finishing between second and fourth from 2015 to 2019. Despite the lack of results, there was no talk of Horner losing his job, and instead Red Bull stuck to their culture of innovation and risk taking to get them back to the front. And they paid off big time. First risk was making a driver change midway through 2016, putting 18 year old Max Verstappen in the second seat alongside Daniel Ricciardo after he impressed at Toro Rosso. Verstappen became the youngest driver in F1 history when he was placed into the Toro Rosso at 17 years old. The Dutchman would prove his appointment right away and win on his debut at the Spanish Grand Prix, brilliantly holding off pressure from Kimi Raikkonen's Ferrari on fresher tyres to take the chequered flag. The second risk was partnering with a struggling Honda for 2019 as an engine partner after their disastrous reintroduction back into F1 with McLaren. This would be the first time during Red Bull's tenure that they wouldn't have to pay for engines, but actually partner with a manufacturer. What made it less of a risk was that the Honda engine had shown improvement with Toro Rosso for 2018, and Red Bull's current engine supplier Renault couldn't seem to get on top of their reliability issues. In the Red Bull package, the Honda flew, and it propelled the team back to the sharp end of F1. This partnership climaxed at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix 2021, when Max Verstappen overtook Lewis Hamilton on the final lap of a controversial title decider to take his first world championship and the team's first honours since 2013. They would go a step further in 2022, dominating the championship. Verstappen would take his second title with three races to spare and the team would win their fifth Constructors' Championship. But once again, success isn't achieved without adversity and risk. Before the start of 2021, Honda would announce they were pulling out of F1 at the end of the season. This would leave Red Bull without an engine partner for 2022 and beyond. And instead of looking for an alternate supplier, Horner and Red Bull once again decided to go against the grain and take a big risk. They decided to become an engine manufacturer of their own, and Red Bull powered trains was created. This represents the full circle for the Red Bull and Christian Horner story, despite it being far from over. When Horner took over, this team was one struggling at the bottom of the F1 grid and without direction. Fast forward 17 years and this team has developed, competed, dominated, fallen back, 
dominated the game and is now competing against the biggest engine manufacturers in the world, despite only being a racing subsidiary of an energy drinks company, as Horner likes to say. It has become one of only three teams to manufacture every aspect of their racing car, joining Ferrari and Mercedes. But there's one thing we haven't covered, and it's what you might know Christian Horner for, Drive to Survive and how Horner deals with the media. Whether it's on the pit wall with Sky Sports, in interviews with Drive to Survive, or the other media. It's a new role that team principals have had to take on with the rise of social media and everyone having an opinion. Team bosses have needed to protect their teams more and more. And Horner has a unique way of doing this, often creating storylines with anything he says, provoking rivals, shielding his drivers, and sometimes angering F1 fans. This approach symbolizes the Red Bull way, being aggressive, forward thinking, and doing things differently. Horner was one of the first team principals to embrace the media. He was the first principal to give access to the pit wall during sessions. This turned into an avenue to present their narrative before anyone else and keep pressure on their rivals in real time. It's this focus on finding advantages in all areas of racing that's got Red Bull to where they are today. Whilst you might argue with how he does this, Horner is taking the spotlight off the drivers, the mechanics and the entire team. He's taking the pressure off all of them so they can do their jobs to the best of their ability. There are a lot of other names that deserve a lot of credit for the rise of Red Bull. But no man epitomizes the drive, the culture, and the resilience of Red Bull more than Christian Horner. With Matasic sadly passing away towards the end of the 2022 season, Christian Horner has become the one consistent in Red Bull Racing's history. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and please click that subscribe button to make sure you never miss another Drive 61 video. And be sure to check out our video about the man F1 band for life. And I'll catch you in the next one.